Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I come from a very elite group of people called White Trash. It wasn't easy. We had a certain image to maintain. When you have a place in society, there's certain things you have to do. Car parked in your yard, go to jail a lot, and police come to your house. You know. Work, 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 work. And I loved, I loved Wayne uh, today. His talk, there's so much of it identify. I don't know about you, but my earliest memories in life was I didn't belong here. I didn't fit in, and something's wrong. Something's wrong, and I had no idea what it was, but I knew it was going on in me, and it probably wasn't going on in you. I knew that. And from a very early age, I didn't like where I lived, my family, and I instinctively knew that was all wrong. So I did the other thing that almost killed me. I never told anybody about that. Never told anybody about I didn't like who I was, who I lived, or anything. All I knew is this. Eventually, if I took a few drinks, I felt better. The hole in my gut with the wind blowing through stopped. What I know now is peace is what I experienced chemically. But I never knew it. And I didn't recognize it when I had it. I just knew that I liked it. And eventually, whatever it took to get that sense, even in passing, I would do. If I had to steal it to get it, then I'd do it. And if I couldn't steal it, I'd lay down beside it and claim it, you know? Uh, Whatever I had to do, whatever I had to take, whose ever heart I had to break. My mothers, the ex-wives, the people who loved me. You know, uh, when I took my inventory, it wasn't the big podium stuff, you know. True story, one time in Scott County Jail, I beat a guy almost to death, and I was stark raving sober. That didn't bother me near as much as the look in my mother's eye. One more time. Beat me all you want. Take that memory away from me. And I was full of memories and what might have been and onlys. What I thought was if those cops would just leave me alone, I'd be all right. If I wasn't born to this family, I'd be all right. Anybody just cut me a break, I'd be all right. That was my problem. And alcohol made it disappear temporarily. I can't make it a whole day without something to ease this mind. And he said, well, all you got to do is try. And that's the only thing I've done consistently for the last 33 plus years, 12,000 plus days, is try. Sometimes greatly, sometimes poorly. But I try. And I started going to meetings, and it was good. Old Logan was there. Logan, God bless him, we buried him last year with 56 years of sobriety. And I was about six months sober, and I had my feet up on the table, and Logan walked in. He said, you think you got all the answers, don't you, kid? And I said, no, but I was thinking, yep, pretty much got this wrapped up. (laughs) And he said, let me tell you something. I was young once, but you've never been old. I was young once, but you've never been old. It is the first time in my entire life I ever considered the possibility you have felt the way I feel. What an act of grace. What an act of opening that door so I could step in just a little bit more. Now, the trouble with getting sober is they bring up that three-letter word. You all know which one I'm talking about. God. I was not like Wayne, I thought for years I was an atheist or an agnostic, but I had knowledge of a God, and I hated everything I knew. Sorry, but I did. You see, I was taught about a God that when I was 10 years old, I had a cousin named Linda who was wonderful. And if there was ever anybody God-like, it was Linda. She was wonderful. She was beautiful. She did everything right. She was in an honor roll. She got a full scholarship. I just hated her. And uh, because she was so good, but I also thought, you know, if there's anybody ever close to God, it's Linda. And one day she was walking to work and a truck hit her, knocked her 200 feet and killed her. And you know the ones I picked out of that? Remember my 299 to 1? 
The ones I picked out were the people that said, God must have wanted an angel. Oh, so he hits you with a truck. I'll pass. Still do. Pass. And I had that. In, in where I lived, I saw things adults shouldn't see, let alone children. And everybody would say things like, God must have had a better purpose for them. God must have saved them from something else in their life. Well, I'll pass on this guy. Sounds like a punk to me. Still does. And I was angry. So you brought that stuff around me. We're going to talk. And I'll tell you something funny. A few years ago, I started a, a place where I'm building a retreat, please, God. And my office is on that very corner. My cousin was killed. And every day when I walk across that street, I celebrate Linda. You see, a few years back, I learned something about me. And Wayne touched on it today. But I learned something about me. About, about a year ago, a guy walked into my office and he said, uh, it was Monday. And he said, well, he said, uh, Friday, I'm really going to have a tough weekend. And I said, why is that? And he said, it's the anniversary of my daughter's death. And I said, so you're planning your depression already? Is... <laughs> well, think about it. He said, what do you mean? I said, did you really love your daughter? He said, oh, yeah, more than death. I said, well, why don't you do this? Spend the whole day celebrating all the goodness she was in your life. All the joys and all the happiness and every good day you ever had. Make it a whole day of celebration and joy because she was in your life. Or do you want to make it all about you? You see, I'm an expert at making it all about me. It could be your tragedy, but I'd take it on. <laughs> Are you okay, Ed? Oh, I could take more. <laughs> and I learned that through the steps. Now, I'm not talking about normal grief. Please understand me. I'm not talking about normal grief, but I'm talking about the insistence on wringing every bit of pain I can out of a painful situation. Every bit of sickness, every bit of attention, every bit of wrangling I can do, so the focus will be on me. I'll talk some more, and I've lost a lot of loved ones sober. Well, no, I didn't really. They just went into another room. Uh, well, that's the way I feel. It's like, you know, this, ain't, this stuff's nothing. Uh, and they went into another room. I didn't lose anybody. In fact, they're more with me today than they've ever been. That's what I've come to believe. And when I want to feel bad, it's just about being a little self-involved. But I had all this trouble with God, as I said, and they, you know, uh, Wayne talked about good others do, good orderly direction. Man, that worked for me. I could deal with that. There was a, about six months sober, you get honesty, and about eight months, you get a little tact to go with it, you know? <laughs> I was at that six month point, and Father Tom comes in. Father Tom was sober. All preachers and ministers and priests have thin blue lips to talk like this. I met a few rabbis that are like this, too. And uh, they all have thin blue lips. And Father Tom did. And he said, Ed, why don't you come back to church? <laughs> I had the honesty part of the program. I told him. I said, I don't go back to church because it's full of thieves, hypocrites, and liars. And I felt good. <laughs> Father Tom looked at me and smiled and said, why don't you come, Ed? One more won't hurt. <laughs> punished him. I didn't talk to him for months, you know. <laughs> but there was something that threw me. I looked around at the old timers and Alcoholics Anonymous, and they had a look in their eye that I couldn't quite explain. And I believe the eyes are the mirror of the soul. They absolutely are. And these old timers would talk about God, and I knew they were telling the truth. I didn't get the angle or how they were doing it, but I knew they were telling the truth. So I made almost a fatal mistake, newly sober. I started professing a faith I didn't have. I started professing a faith other than my own experience. You hear a lot of good, wonderful things in meetings. But if you don't know them and if you haven't experienced them, try to keep it to your experience is all I can tell you. Because it'll almost, it almost cost me my life. Because I got to a point where I needed that faith. And it was not there. I'll tell you how that happened. I was about a year sober and, uh, I just celebrated my year's birthday, and the old man asked me over to the house, you know. And I don't know about you, but when my old man asked me over to the house, I'm in trouble. 
and I'd been hanging around A and A for a year. And you said I got to bring new attitudes into old situations. You know, I can't let them work my program. I got to bring my program into them. So they said, suit up, show up. So I went to dinner, and about halfway through dinner, Dad said, "Boy," and I thought, "Oh, here it comes." And I said, "Yeah, Pop." He said, "Just wanted to tell you I'm proud of you." And I need to tell you something. If you would have put a lie detector on me when I walked into that house and said, "Ed, do you care what that old man thinks about you?" I would have said no, and it would have said true. How grateful I was that I was so wrong. How grateful I am that I was so darn wrong about so many things in my life that I absolutely knew was the truth. You see, when I came to AA, they said wonderful things had happened. Try to make a list of things you'd like to happen. That wouldn't have made the list because you see, that's impossible. Because I knew that old man hated me. No, what he wanted was for his boy to do better, and I just couldn't get it. Man, I left there and it was one of the best nights of my life. And I, I went to a, a meeting and I went to, to my sister-in-law's house afterwards. And I got a call from my mother who was crying and hysterical and said, "Ed, come home quick." My dad went across the street to get him a quart of beer and me a bottle of hop. And now they're carrying out bodies. And I don't know what's going on. And I just never heard her that hysterical before. And I jumped in the car and it was one of those ice storm nights. I don't know if you ever get them down here. Uh, probably not. <laughs> well, no, you know. When you get a, a, a layer of ice over everything, do you get those from time to time? See, and you know. <laughs> but uh, it was one of those nights where it was just solid ice everywhere. And I made it across town, and I pulled up to that bar, and there were more cops there than I'd ever seen. And it's funny, that year I was sober, those cops really shaped up. <laughs> If you're new tonight, you quit swinging, they'll quit arresting. <laughs> Who knew? Keep this shut and just say yes, sir, and no, sir, and thank you, and you usually go home. <laughs> Who knew? I walked into that uh, bar that I'd spent many a night in. I'd been drinking in there since I was 11 years old. They never ID'd me. And I walked in. There was an officer in there, and uh, I said, "He said, Ed, what are you doing here?" And I said, "My dad was in here." He said, "Oh my God, Ed!" And I said, "What? What's going on?" He said, "All we know, Ed, is somebody came in and opened fire and shot everybody." And I looked down the bar and I saw a pool of blood. I saw a pool of blood with my father's glasses all smashed up in it, and I didn't want to know. Didn't want to know, but I knew. Didn't want to, but I knew. And the officer said they took all the bodies up to the hospital. Ed, you'll have to go up there. And he was very nice and he was very kind. And I went up to the hospital and I ran into an officer that hadn't forgotten the old days, and he was rude and vulgar and abrupt. A guy named Iverson. God bless him. And、uh, he suggested to me that he'd identified all the bodies, and I better get out of there or he'll have me arrested. And an AA miracle happened. I said okay, and I turned around and went away because I'm a cop fighter. And a year and a half before that, they would have been looking for a new lieutenant. I don't mind telling you. But you see, hanging around, you changed my heart and changed my mind, and I didn't even know it. I, honest to God, didn't know it. I just knew my heart ached more than it had ever ached in my life that night. And I went home and I called the one guy that I would have never dreamed I called. He was a lieutenant of the narco division, Bob Garner. <laughs> and for the last five years of my life, he tried to put me behind bars. He got me in back of the squad one day and said, "Ed, if I see you leaving the scene of the crime." Or think I see you leaving the scene of the crime? I'm going to shoot to kill and not stop. And I said, everything's fair in love and war, chump. We had a wonderful report. <laughs> That's the guy I called. You know why? He knew I was sober. And he said, Ed, what's going on?、And、I said, Dad was in the Shamrock. He said, Oh my God, Ed, hold on. And he loved me that night. I used to say he was kind to me. He loved me that night. He fed me information he wasn't supposed to feed me. He gave me thoughts and ideas that were going on at the station that nobody should have known. But he knew my heart was broken, and he knew what I used to be like, and he knew it was a flat miracle I was sober. And he fed me the information. He said, "All we can come up with, Ed, is that he was either shot and、uh, they took him with him, took him hostage, or he shot and he wandered outside, and we'll form a search party and we'll search for him." And,、uh, I'd always hoped you wouldn't know that feeling, and then September 11th happened. That needless act of homicide—it's so hard to understand. 
and you're just empty and hollow and horrified all at once. And you just walk around in a daze and you're looking under parked cars for your dad and in the street corners and you, uh, you don't want to, but you got to look because he might be there. And the only thing I could remember that night was the serenity prayer and I could only remember it one word at a time. Thanks God. And that's the only thing I had going. And the next morning I walked up to the, I walked back to the house and mom said, Ed, there's a phone call for you. And I got on the phone. It was an officer from the police, uh, the policeman from the night before from the hospital. And he said, well, Ed, come on up. Anybody could have made a mistake. We need you to identify your old man. And I said, okay. And I walked up there and I walked into that morgue and I saw my father laying there with that bullet hole in his face. And I reached for that faith I'd been professing. And I come up with a handful of nothing because it wasn't mine. It was nice thoughts, but it was nothing of mine. And I don't know that I've ever felt more alone or more sad than I felt that moment. And I walked out the door, and guess who was there? A member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what they did? They looked at me and just gave me a little wink, give me a thumbs up. And Wayne wonders how I show up when his daughter's sick. It's because I was taught by the very best. And everywhere I went, there were people from AA everywhere. The police station, the funeral home. It was still Iowa's most heinous crime. And they, you know, it was just thousands of people come to the funeral. And it was just amazing. And I was just torn. I I couldn't get it because I was trying to pray to this God. And I thought I had something going. But... Then this whole idea, this God, and this, you know, taking people to heaven and shoots people in the face and hits them with trucks. And I, man, went to the funeral and there was a guy named Father Grubb there, did the funeral, and he gave me one of the keys to the kingdom. About halfway through the funeral, he said, you know, a lot of people would say Clifford's death is God's will. And he said, I don't believe that. And I sat right up in the pew. He said, I believe God created human beings and gave them a free will. Some of those people chose to do this act, and now it's God's will. Man, you mean the reason Linda died is there was human error? Yeah. Do you mean all those people died September 11th because somebody had real evil thoughts and drove planes into buildings, and God weeped louder than we could imagine? Yeah. You mean all the loved ones I'm dying of can- that are dying of cancer, God's not taking them, but we're polluting everything we touch and we want to blame it on everybody else? Yeah. I don't know about you, but in my heart and mind, if it isn't good, it isn't God. Why are the two children starving on all over the country, including this one, all over the world, including this country? Real simple. We don't feed them. More than enough food. Don't blame God anymore. What a freedom that was. You know, early on, I kind of hoped I could believe in a God that was kind and loving and forgiving. On one of the worst days of my life, I got that gift. You see, that's the way my God works. The most heinous, worst things in my life, he'll give me gifts beyond measure. If I just pay attention and stay around long enough to use them. Shortly after that, uh, they caught the guys that did it, and they called me in. The guy was sitting there, and one of the guys uh, was sitting there, and he had his attitude and his little do and acting tough. And I thought, you know, you give me five minutes with him. We don't need a trial. <laughs> I'll take care of that punk now. And I was dead serious. I wasn't talking about slapping him around today. I would have took him out. I went to the court, and I did my testimony. Yeah, that's him. And yeah, that's my dad. And I left. Shortly after that, uh, they were all convicted and sent to prison. And I thought I was done with it. I really did. And uh, about ten years ago, I was uh, at a Christian retreat, and I had a spiritual awakening. And and, and very much like Bill said, it was a, a moment that changed my heart and my mind from that moment to this. And God said, I want you to be a minister. And uh, I said, okay. And I'd never been one before, so it was kind of tough. (laughs) But in three weeks, I had my church. I went to the Methodist church, and if you're breathing, you're in, you know. Well, I mean, 
there's a terrible crisis. Not so much anymore. One of the gifts of September 11th is more people are entering the ministry and the clergy. Thank you, God. That's one of those gifts that he brings out of tragedy. He didn't cause that to happen, so that would happen, but that's a gift because that happened, I believe. And uh, within three weeks, I was doing uh, services, and I was doing sermons, and I was just, uh, and then they told me, we need you to go get your BA, and we need you to go get our Masters of Divinity, and they said it was 220 hours of college credit. I didn't tell you before, but I got kicked out of school in seventh grade. And I quit paying attention a few years before that. <laughs> but I know this, when God calls me to do something, I'm not going to argue. So I went over to the university and uh, walked in and I said, excuse me, I'd like to go to school. And they said, how many credits do you have? And I said, I have bad credits. Why? What's that? Got? <laughs> and they laughed like you did. <laughs> but it was the gift Wayne Shea shared sometime today. I was able to look him in the eye and say, you don't seem to understand. I don't know how to go to school. I'm not sure if I'm smart enough to pass a class. Will you help me? And of course they said yes. Because when you look people in the eye and you're honest with them, God is in our midst, I believe. And a healing begins. And I started the school. And I didn't clap and I didn't take any special classes to give me credit for what I'd done because I'd been so against education. I thought, by gosh, am I going to get these? I'm going to get every hour. So 220 hours later, when I got my master's and when I got my BA. You know, I was preaching about three years ago, and I was preaching on forgiveness, oddly enough. And I got about halfway through my sermon, and I realized I hadn't forgiven the guys who killed my father. That's not quite true. I'd forgiven them, but I hadn't told them. And that's just half an amend. I believe a little different than Wayne does on 8 and 9. I have come to believe that 8 and 9 has absolutely nothing to do with me. It has to do with healing the damage I did. It isn't about me. It's about making right the damage I did. And uh, I'm halfway through this sermon on forgiveness, and I catch that, and I stop right in the middle of it. And I told my congregation, I said, you know, I need to tell you something. I was preaching on the verse, uh, don't bring, uh, you know, if you got any problems with your brothers, don't come to this altar. Take care of them first, then come here. And I realized I hadn't cleared that up. So I made a covenant with them right there that I'd seek out the guys that killed my father. And uh, let them know that they were forgiven. As God would have it, two and a half weeks later, uh, one of the guy's sentence was overturned. I didn't even know he was trying for an appeal, you know, and it got overturned. And the press came to me, because in my community, I'm pleased to tell you, because of the way you've taught me to behave and live, that I'm well respected and I'm loved. And the press came to me and said, uh, Reverend Ed, what do you think? And I said, you know, it's time to heal. It's time to forgive. It's time to... Time to start fresh. And they said, well, he went in there when he was 17. He doesn't know how to work. It's maximum security prison for 27 and a half years. What's he going to do? How's he going to support himself? And I said, he can come live with me if he wants. And people were taken back by that. And I'm not sure why. Cliff and Pat let me into their house. I knew what I was capable of. Nothing that that boy did. You let me into your homes. How dare I? How dare I not let him into mine? And that story literally went around the world. Oprah called me. 48 Hours called me. AP stories. Everybody's called. How could you do that? How could you do that? How could you do that? And you know, you just couldn't say, well, say it's called step eight and nine. And if you, <laughs> if you really work them, Oprah. <laughs> But it was amazing, and uh, as God would have it, two and a half weeks later, I was walking down a prison prison hallway, and uh, I saw a guy I hadn't seen in 27 and a half years. Last time I saw him, I was in a courtroom, and I thought, you give me five minutes with him, we don't need a trial. And that uh, cell door opened, and he looked at me, and he didn't know what to expect. And I looked him right in the eye, and I put out my hand, and I said, Sherman, my name's Reverend Ed Mutum, and I'm here to tell you that God loves you, and I love you. And God forgives you and I forgive you. And if there's anything I can ever do to make your life better, please allow me to do that for you. And I believe he looked in this old timer's eyes and he knew I wasn't lying. He couldn't quite figure it out, but he knew I was telling the truth. And the healing began. A couple weeks went by and they decided to retry Sherman. State of Iowa, if you're caught in an act of a felony, 
with someone, you're guilty, life imprisonment. And I went down to the county attorney who knows and trusts me and respects me, and I asked him to give my friend a break. And he said, Ed, the guy's conning you. And I said, he don't even know I'm here. I'm asking you to give my friend a break. Let him plead to second-degree murder. Let him come home. And he listened to me. And it took us two years to get him home. And the state of Iowa gave me the privilege to go up to jail. In fact, they'd only release him to my custody. And I picked him up. And I got to take him out and I got to buy him his clothes and figure out what size he was because he'd only wore a prison issue for the last 30 years then. I got to give him a key to an apartment so he could open his own door. A lot of people say to me, how could I forgive the guy who killed my father? And all of them. I need to tell you that the trigger man, uh, the Sherman, who got out of prison, uh, was a lookout. And he kind of got, I found out later, he kind of got hustled into going. But the trigger man is out in Arizona at the federal prison out there. And uh, he pistol whipped everybody and shot him four or five times and then pistol whipped him again. And I wrote him a letter. And I said, uh, Glenn, my name's Reverend Ed Muta. And I'm here to tell you that I love you. And God loves you. And I'm the son of Clifford Muta. You may remember him from the Shamrock. And I just want you to know that if there's anything I can ever do to make your life better, let me do that. I didn't expect to hear back from him. I just knew what I needed to do. I needed to clear my side of the street. And see, forgiveness isn't nothing if you don't tell them they are. It's self-serving then. Forgiveness isn't about serving of self. It's about healing. It's about moving on. And I never heard from him for months. And I, to be honest with you, I kind of forgot about it. And then it was Christmas Eve a year ago. I was preparing for service and went home to check my mail. And there's a letter from Glenn. And Glenn said, you know, Reverend Needham, it took me a long time to write you back because you're one of the last people I ever expected to hear from. And Glenn has uh, killed three other people since he's been in prison. And one of the things I said in the letter, as I said, I'm so sorry for the decisions you've made in your life. I know it must be hard living your life. And he said, you know, I never thought of it that way, but it was me. And he said, I don't think you can ever help me at all. But the fact that you offered me helps me more than you can ever imagine. And I got a little letter from him a little while back. And he said, Reverend Muta, my mother's dying. Can you help me see my mom before she dies? I'm going to do whatever I can. Because that's my job. Not because I'm a minister. Because I'm a child of God. And Glenn's my brother. Did he screw up? Absolutely. Who in here hasn't? Whatever you're unwilling to forgive, look at your own inventory. I don't know about you, but there's three things on my inventory that I've done to people. If I want to get mad, I look at those from time to time. And if I can get through all three, I have the right to get a resentment. <laughs> Usually don't get past one. Usually don't get past one. You know, when we take an inventory, we write that inventory. And before, if you're like me, by God, we want justice. I want, I want justice. I'm tired of being taken advantage of. I want justice. And you write a good inventory and you take a good fifth step and you come out of there going, I'd like mercy, please. <laughs> mercy for me. Thank you very much. Because I... <laughs> you understand if it's justice, you've got to pay for everything you've ever done. But I'm delighted to be here. Uh, uh, let's, let's just take a minute and understand what the whole idea of forgiveness is about. I don't know about you, but I had it goofed up for a long time. I thought it had to do something with them. And forgiveness has everything to do to me. You'd think we know that because we're so self-obsessed. But... <laughs> because, you see, uh, resentment gives me a sense of power. If I can hate you, at least I can do something. And it's a sickness that really entered every area of my life. It's not about an intellectual exercise that will help me understand my demons. <laughs> it's about a house cleaning that begins here. And if it doesn't begin here, it better start here sooner or later. 
or it's never going to be done. And if it's never done, in my experience, in what I've watched people do, is, is we lose a got a lot of good people because they don't know how to do one thing, and that's forgive. You know, when you talk about forgiveness, it's such a wide, wide uh, topic. One of the things that I, I, I remember the most that people talk about, and it's real hip to talk about today, is child molestation. I was molested when I was seven by a woman 26 years old next door, and I still think about it. Now, am I bad for that? If you hear everybody else, I'm bad for that. Why am I bad for that? All I know is somebody in my life was kind to me. Now, was it the right thing to do? Of course not. But you see, I have a choice how to feel about that. I was talking in Texas not too long ago, and uh, Longview, Texas, and it was a good time down there. We had a good time, and I'd give my talk like I gave last night, and a woman come up to me and said, I want to talk to you. I thought, "Uh uh-oh, here we go. (laughs) And she said, "Uh, I've hated my father for 56 years, and he's been dead for 20. And I said, how's that working for you? (laughs) She said, I'm very angry. That's how I am. I said, yeah, I can see that. I said, why did you hate him? He said, he molested me when I was a child. And I said, and he's been dead for 20 years. And she said, yeah. And I said, so you've kept the molestation alive. He's gone. And she said, well, I never thought about it like that. And I said, why not? He's not here to perpetuate that nastiness and that hate and that ill feeling you have. And then she asked me one of the best questions I've ever been asked. And God gave me an answer like that. She looked at me and said, Well, let me ask you this. What if I die and go to heaven and he's there? (laughs) What a great question. What a great question. And like that, God said to tell her, wouldn't that be a wonderful place to find him? Because if you've seen heaven, he understands the harm he's done. And he's asked for forgiveness. What better place to meet him? You know, those are the ways we got to look at things to heal. Angry and resentment's easy. Forgiveness is tough. Why? Because I'm a collector of ones. If there's anything negative going around, I talked about it last night, the 299 to 1. If there's anything negative going around, I'll collect it and I'll hang on to it. There were so many things I resented from childhood. God, ooh, I resented God. I can remember my household would turn on the light in the middle of the night and a million cockroaches would run everywhere and I'm just trying to get a drink of water. And I used to go to church and there used to be a common theme I heard, I picked up in church, and that was, God is responsible for everything. (laughs) Ever hear that one? Every hair that... (laughs) Wayne, you don't like us, bud. (laughs) Every bird that... You know, and that's all good... Stuff, unless you're a collector of ones. Because when I turn on that light, and all those roaches run everywhere, and on Friday night when Dad would drink up the check and there wouldn't be any food for the family for the week, or the police had come, or my brother would be taken away again, I started thinking God must not like me much. Because why would he do that to me? What did I do? Why am I so bad? So you start doing something that comes very natural when you have that. You start hating God. Start hating God. And you know, in forgiveness, that's one of the first things I had to give. Not God, but my perception of God. You see, that's what was warped. The God I know and believe in today has nothing to do with what I heard then. But it has everything to do with what makes me complete today. And I learned that here, but I first had to acknowledge that maybe I'm wrong about God. Maybe I'm wrong about God. Hated my dad. You ever had that feeling? Dad's a drunk. You wish he'd be dead and then you cry yourself to sleep because you know you're not supposed to wish that. came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and you taught me I didn't hate my dad. I hated the disease. There's a big difference. And I had to forgive that. See, I like staying mad, because if I could stay mad, then I could blame everything on you. 
Uh, but I had to forgive God. And how I forgave God, I had to forgive my perception of God. And why I make that distinction is I had to understand that what I was mad at is what I believed. It wasn't God. Two different things. I believed that God was a punishing God that made people suffer. And if you weren't on his favorite list, you were going to burn in hell. And I had no chance of getting there, I'll tell you. And it was quite clear. And uh, uh, I had to redo that. I had to rewrite that because simply because if I'm going to live with peace and serenity inside of me, that's where it's got to change. Let's talk about exes, ex-spouses, ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends. Never any resentment there. <laughs> they own you. They own you. They own your heart. They own your mind. They own your private moments. They're your God. That's why forgiveness is important. Until you forgive them, they'll own you. The minute you see a picture of them, they'll own you. The minute you think of them, they'll own you. And that's not what we're supposed to be about today. Step three says we're, you know, freedom from the bondage of self. And and part of freedom from the bondage of myself is learning to forgive that stuff, not justify it so I can keep going on it. You know, uh, when my father was murdered, I know one thing real clearly, that I could have took those guys out and no court would have convicted me. I had that knowledge. And I'll tell you, I don't share this much, but I want to tell you because uh, it was about like a year and a half. Uh, of murder trials, and I talked about it last night, and I said I behaved myself, and I did. But I was working in the courts then, and I remember it took about a year and a half for the trials to be completed, and uh, uh, I was down at the county courthouse, county jail, for something, I don't remember what, just happened to be there, and they're bringing these guys down for sentencing. And they're bad rapping me. They remember me from court. And they're saying, we got your old man. And I'm thinking, you punk, I'll take you up. And I'm just getting, and they're just bad mouthing me and bad mouthing me. And the sheriff, the deputy sheriff in front of me, said, "Hold it down in there." You know, I had to do Wayne. <laughs> and they didn't hold it down. Of course, what do they got to lose? They're going away for life. And they kept mouthing off. And that deputy sheriff pulled his gun out, laid it right in front of me, to go in and shut him up. Now, for a year, I had thought, "How can I even the score? How can I get?" And here I was given the opportunity. And the strangest thing happened. I looked at those kids. Oldest one was 18. And I remember the first time I went to jail. Oh, I had a tough mouth. I was tough. Just hope nobody see me crying myself to sleep that night because I'm terrified. And I thought they're going to spend the rest of their lives doing that. And I was amazed because I walked away praying. You couldn't have convinced me of that because you see they owned me. They owned my heart and they owned my mind and I wanted to take them out. And I was given the opportunity and like I said, no court would have convicted me. And I walked away praying. Now did that free them? No. Freed me. I think that's one of the big reasons that I eventually even forgot the names of the guys who killed my father. Now, that's a good resentment. You don't want to let go of that kind of stuff. Remember them. Think about them from time to time. Get worked up. You know, every once in a while, an appeal come through, and you can get really mad again. Self-righteous. And it took a conscious effort to step away from being the son of a murder victim so I didn't get the juice. When you'd walk into a room, oh, that's it. I know his father was murdered. I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't know there was a payoff. And when I saw it, it made me sick to my stomach. And I quit it. Because I'm not a victim anymore. And I'm certainly not a volunteer. I'm a free man by the grace of God and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if I want to continue to be that, i got to forgive whatever comes up. Exes told you the experience I have with my I pray for my ex-wife every day and I'm not being smart about that I'm not being sarcastic about that with all that hate she has for me that's got to be painful 
That's got to be painful. And I hope someday she finds some peace with it. I hope someday my kids can experience the peace rather than the hate. Because it takes its toll when we hate our exes. It reflects in our children in their lives. Some of us get that. Some of us don't. But I can't resent her. Because if I resent her, all it does is take away from my quality and my living with you. Anytime I'm resenting anything in my past, it takes me away from the quality of living with you. It taints everything. And, 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 you know, in a relationship, well, I can't trust men. Well, I can't trust women. Can't trust you. That's the problem. <laughs> you know, you get that worked out, you might have a shot elsewhere, you know. But it's here where we got to do the work. Here's where we got to do the work. Forgiveness. Why not? Because I said it before. It's easier to stay angry. It's comfortable. It's convenient. Most of all, it's familiar. Turmoil is familiar. Turmoil is comfortable. Turmoil gives me a sense of power when I am powerless or scared. One and the same. And I had to learn to not use that tool anymore. That's tough. That's tough. I used to use my physical size and my strength for intimidation. I can't do that anymore, day at a time. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't use my, my hate is power for a sense of being. I don't want to be that anymore. I don't want that to be the reason I'm living or dying anymore. Why do we forgive to heal? Now, a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, I can forgive, but I can't forget. <laughs> yeah, right. Might as well send that one home. <laughs> well, you really, you know. All that means is, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> forgive and can't forget, just, just forget about forgiving. Because that isn't what it's about. You know, uh, when I think about uh, the murder scene of my father, there, there's always that one point, and it's happened for 33, well, not 33, 32 years, uh, that when I remember that murder scene and that pool of blood and my father's glasses in it, it still brings me to tears. But there is no resentment and malice. It was just one of the saddest things I ever saw. And I don't know if that will ever change, but I can change the malice. I can change the malice. I have that power. You want to be forgiving? Act like it. Do it. Talk's cheap. You want to feel better? Do these steps in their entirety. Talks cheap. I've been blessed to talk with several people this weekend about different things that's going on in their life, and that's always such an honor to me. It really is, and I appreciate you giving me your time. And uh, it, it's always amazing because uh, uh, we always want to uh, blame our situation on somebody else. Or it's an area of our life that we don't want to work the program in. Like porno, Gambling, shoplifting, all those things none of us would do, but they would. <laughs> but I gotta do this in every area of my life, and that shouldn't be scary. Look what it did for your alcoholism. Look what it did for your drug addiction. Look what it did for your ism. Why on earth would we be afraid to do it in every area of our life? Simple. We don't wanna. I want happy, joyous, and free, but on my terms. I want the right to hate. I want the right to resent. I want the right to gossip. I want the right to spread crap about people. I want the right to think bad. I want the right to feel bad. I want the right, and I want to be happy. Okay. How's that work? And the answer, that's right, it doesn't work, and I tried that for a long time. I, honest to God, did. I thought I was doing well. This isn't just about not drinking. It's about a way of life that changes. And if I want to insist, what is the, what is the number one offender in the book? Resentment. If we don't take care of that in every area of our life, and if we keep building guilt that we got to build defenses and anger to defend, we can't get better. 
Nobody here is too bad to get better. That's another thing I had to figure out. I hated God. Why? Because I'd never be good enough. I know that. Oh, I'd be good for a while, and then I'd goof up again, you know. So he can't like me much. And one of the things I learned about the God that I know and love today is he loves me exactly the way I am right now, spots and all. In fact, the God that I know and love sees me without anything wrong with me because he sees the true me. What I see is what I create down here. And the whole idea of the 12 steps of my understanding is to create, dispense with the mess that I create so I can see God's idea for my life and see me through God's eyes. You know, most of the problems people have today is child abuse. Now, what do I mean by that? We're all children of God, and we abuse ourselves completely. How do you forgive yourself? You do it. You start treating yourself as if you actually care about you. You start treating yourself the same way you good somebody you actually like. <laughs> that was a good comparison for me because I could I could do that. So okay, uh, you know that there's in the Bible it says uh, um, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and I thought I wouldn't treat my neighbor that bad. I kind of like them, you know. <laughs> that kind of rang a bell, <laughs> and I started thinking, well, you know, my neighbor's pretty much a stranger. Why would I treat him better than me that I've been with all my life? Lack of forgiveness is the term. Unwillingness to forgive me for what? Being human. That's the worst I am. Human. I hear a lot of people today say, oh, I only want to be human. I'll pass. <laughs> I've been about as human as I want to be. Thank you very much. <laughs> what I want to be is spiritual. I believe we're gifted as human beings because we have the power to be spiritual. I want to rise above my humanness. And the only way I can do that is through a spiritual way of life. What do I mean by that? We have to work these principles in all our affairs, every area of our life. It's awful easy to come to AA and look like you're reforming for an hour. How are you doing on the freeway? How are you doing at 2 o'clock in the morning when there's nobody around to impress and your head's going? That'll tell you how you're doing. You know? Uh, we've got to work this program at depth, and it's got to be at depth. And and one of the reasons is I liked anger is because it always kept me from really looking at me and what made me tick. You know, what really makes me tick? What do I? What's the payoff for me being angry? And I've already told you, it was power and a sense of control, and a sense of being a uh, 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 master of my destiny. If you will. And I really was. You know, I had a faith. Part of forgiveness is a new kind of faith. But I had a faith then. It was called Murphy's Law. You know Murphy's Law? Waiting for the other shoe to drop. Just a matter of time. People like me can't do things like that. You don't seem to understand if you really knew all the places I'd been. Now, I not only said it, but I professed it, and it was my faith. And it came true. Time after time after time, even sober. I had to forgive myself. By the way, before I forget it, there's a basket in the back. Uh, the voice forgot to mention it, and I forgot to tell just now. If you got a question, go back there and write it, and he'll run it up. If you got a question about forgiveness you want to uh, ask any time during one day, and if you don't want to, that's fine, too. I just always like to offer that. Any anger I'm carrying, any resentment I'm carrying, any unwillingness to forgive anything in life has a direct reflection on the people I care about most. Even me. What good is it for me to go out there and carry a message of hate and resentment and anger? What good is it for us to carry that message at home with our kids? What good is it uh, to take it to work? <laughs> what good is it to spread it around in meetings? You know, the question is, are you carrying the message or the mess, you know? You want to know who your God is? What you spend most of your time thinking about. 
Think about it. That's your God. If it's anger at the ex, if it's anger at work, if it's sex, if it's drinking, that's your God. And the only power we have to do, to, to change that is to change our minds. And we do that one moment at a time. When I have to deal with that ex-wife, by the way, last year I was paying her child support through Iowa for 12 years. And when I left the Methodist church and, and started this new church, things were a little tight. And Iowa was fed up because they couldn't get the proper documentation from her. So they said, we're not handling it anymore. Sent it back to California, and I got a bill for $487,300. And they said to me, we don't care you've been paying Iowa. You were supposed to be paying us. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I laughed. I said, God, can't wait to see what you're going to do with this one. <laughs> they want me to send them $16,000 a month. I thought, yeah, you bet. <laughs> now I had a choice there. I could have gotten really enraged and really self-righteous and really this and really that. What I did is what I've been taught to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I called the, the place and waited on hold for 30 years. <laughs> and uh, this guy come on and I said, you know, I've been paying child support. I got all the records and that and then ship them out. And that's been a year. And uh, uh, this new church has had a lot of financial struggles. I've lost pretty much everything in the last couple of years again, which is fine. You know, I don't care. Uh, it'll all come back if it's supposed to. But I haven't been able to pay like I wanted to pay either. But I pay whatever I can, and they, they know my records. I send them my bank statements, everything, so they know that I'm doing the very best I can. And every day, I don't whine about that. I don't set up, wake up startled at night about half a million dollars, how am I going to do that? That's not my job. Why isn't it my job? I told you just a minute ago. I made the decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. If He wants me to pay $500,000, cough it up. <laughs> now I'll tell you something I've learned. He will. He will. It's about changing our heart and changing our mind. That's what forgiveness is about. That God I resented for years and wouldn't talk about, man, I just love hanging out with him now. He's with me everywhere and I try to talk to him every chance I remember. I try to make my every conscious thought something about God. Like I said last night, my desire is to make my every thought a prayer. And I have a God today that takes better care of me than I ever dreamed of. Forgiveness. I believe I deserve the very best in the world that God gives me. And that ain't ego. I had to fight to get there. I had to believe that God loves me just as much as he loves you. And the only way I could do that is forgive the past and forgive all the ammo I had about this whole God thing. I really had to get to the point where I knew I wasn't a piece of trash anymore. I knew that deep in my soul and all the nice things that were said about me didn't matter. All the kind things you could say and all the love I'd got from people didn't matter because I thought I knew the truth. I am so pleased to tell you that I was wrong. And I'm free from that now. There's an old saying that's corny now. It's been overused and overused, but God doesn't make junk. And I believe God made everybody here. And everybody I come in contact with. And what do I want for you? The very best God has to offer you. And I have to insist on that for me. Because I'm one of God's kids too. I have to put it into action. I have to give what I wish to receive. And I said it last night. I asked my sponsor one time. I said, how do you be a gentleman? He said, you act like one. And I thought, boy, I would have never thought of that. You want to change? Act like it. You want to be sane? Be sane. Do the work you need to do to be sane and then get on with the business of living. 
You know, how can you go to sleep on a soft pillow if you've been mean and angry and unforgiving all day? And if you're walking around mean and angry, it's called not willing to forgive something. Isn't it? I have a little, uh, I told you my story last night when I threw the guy over the car. I don't do that anymore. I haven't done that in some time, but I'll tell you what. I use that as one of my wonderful signs. If I start getting grumpy with the driver in front of me, that's a sign. I need to work right here. The problem is not out there. The problem is right here. And the more I have, uh, the more I have an insistence on resolving the problem here and working these steps in my life, the better chance I have of living in. You know, in the book, it talks about having a piece of heaven right here on earth. When you read those promises, do you hear those words? That's your guarantee. Guarantee. If you'll only do it. And why can't we do that? Because it isn't comfortable. It isn't familiar. The program to me is to challenge me to be uncomfortable. What is uncomfortable? Stop being sick. Because I believe in God's in every one of us. So if I feel some God esteem, you got to have it too. And you got to have it too. So it lifts us all up. It isn't about me. It's about God as I understand. Do you know what I've been saying lately? I just believe in you, God. I'll do what you need me to do. I'll walk through the fear. Do what you need me to do. And he has blessed me abundantly. And the other thing he's taught me is I don't need anything from any other human being anymore. What a freedom. I learned that through the steps. And I learned that through emotional sobriety and language of the heart written by Bill Wilson. That my dependency is on a God I believe in. And I didn't learn to believe in the God I love and know in seminary. I have learned this. That the worst of my life's experience because of forgiveness and healing has become my most powerful tools in my ministry and in life. Greatest Christmas gift I got last year was a letter from a retreat that I'd given. And the lady wrote and said, you probably don't remember me, and I don't. But I was so pleased that she wrote me. She said, you spent a few minutes talking to me. And I wanted to tell you that this is the first, I got it right after, after Christmas. Said that this is the first Christmas in 25 years that I didn't resent my mother and we had a wonderful time. I wouldn't take a million dollars for that. There was a man walked up to me before I talked last night and uh, he knew a new friend of mine who just passed away. I got to meet him when he was full of cancer. We were able to talk about his resentment toward God and why he had to go. And he came up and hugged me and he said, you know, I spent the last day of Rob's life with him. And he said, what you shared with him made him go home peacefully. I wouldn't trade that. You take all the jobs, all the stuff in the world. Yet I couldn't if I didn't do what this program asked. Forgiveness is hard. But it's the most healing thing I've ever done. Today, there's nobody else I want to be. I always spent my whole life wanting to be somebody else, some other place, some other time. And man, I love hanging out with me now. I am enough for the first time in my life. You know, we're in a day and a time when a lot of things aren't too sure, but I'm sure of a couple things. Each day I want to get closer to God. I asked Chuck C. years ago, how do you pray? And he said, you're every thought's a prayer, Ed. And I went, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Did a little edit of what I'd been thinking and knew I wasn't in too good a shape. But I simply asked myself this, well, if it's crap, why am I thinking? it? I decided to change my mind. And I try to make my every thought a prayer. And I'm closer to it than I've ever been, and i still got a long way to go, but I like what's happening. About two years ago, I was watching a show that I like to watch, Actor Studio, and this actor was on there, and I can't remember his name right now, but uh, he was on there, and at the end of the show, uh, the interviewer always says, if there is God, if there is a heaven, 
When you die, what would you hope God would say to you when you approach those pearly gates? And he thought for a minute, and he looked up at the interviewer, and he said, thank you. Best sermon I've ever heard. What if we lived our life so when we died, God said, thank you. See, all my life I was seeing what God could do for me. I think I want to do my life so if I get a chance to go to those gates, God looks at me and says, thanks, Ed. Job well done. Day at a time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.